Welcome everybody to our third series, third in our series of Lunch and Learns on compassion. I truly believe that compassion plays a role in the things that we do. And today we're going to talk to some awesome volunteers that give of their time daily, hourly and everything, get to hear about what they do and why they do it and where their compassion comes from. Again, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, we have a couple commissioners in attendance. Alfie DeBella from the YWCA will be here and she will be the moderator today. And we have Commissioner Allison Poyer in the back of the room. And she just works like, oh, unbelievable. And we thank both of you for being here. I'd also like to introduce my other staff members. We have, um, we have Bonnie back in the back, and I don't know Bonnie's name. She just started this week, but she's wonderful. But Bonnie's back in the back, and then we have Miranda Pierce back there, and we also have Nelson Hewitt, but he's the greeter, and he helps people get down here. So I want to thank you staff members for all that you do. Thank you volunteers for being here, and I do have the honor and privilege to introduce Elfie DeBella. Thank you very much. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here today. As Gail mentioned, I'm Melfi DeBella, and I am the president and CEO of YWCA Columbus, but I also have the honor of serving as a commissioner on the Community Relations Commission, and I'm excited to be part of this wonderful luncheon today. Before we get started, let me just take a moment to once again recognize Molina Health in their generosity in providing today's luncheon. And of, we have also been joined by a representative from Molina Health. So th thank you very much. <laughs> also, you will notice we have a resource table set up in the back with great material. So please make sure you take a look at that. And at the end of today's luncheon, please take a moment to fill out our survey and leave it at our sign-in table. As Gail just mentioned, you have joined us uh, for the third luncheon in this series. And the last two sessions, we had topics that looked at compassion in connection with beliefs and victims of gr crime. And so today we are exploring um, compassion in connection with volunteers and volunteerism. And we are joined by a stellar panel of subject matter experts from whom you will hear, hear in just a second. Each of them have volunteered for many years and they are making truly a profound difference in our community. As I looked up the definition of uh, compassion in the dictionary component, it indicated that if someone shows kindness, caring, and a willingness to help others, they're showing compassion. Compassion is certainly something that is near and dear to my heart and truly part of my DNA. But certainly as a nonprofit leader, I truly appreciate the importance of volunteerism and compassion. YWCA Columbus could not do the critical work that they're doing, we're doing, without the help of our over 5,500 volunteers. So as we hear from our um, panelists today, I will ask them to introduce themselves and who they represent and share with you how and where they volunteer. Shall we start with Connie? Is this, is this on now? Okay, thank you. My name's Connie Everett. Um, I volunteer with a lot of organizations and do a lot of different things, um, produce events for, to raise money for things. And, and, um, but today I'm here with Simply Living. Uh, I produce the um, gift to be simple each year, coordinate that for them and work with them. Simply Living is an organization that is dedicated to building sustainable communities, developing sustainable habits, and, a, and living on a sustainable planet. Um, and they provide all sorts of educational opportunities and volunteer opportunities. Um, uh, they're involved in everything from sustainable energy to sustainable food production. Um, a very, very interesting organization. It's been around for a long time. Um, I'm also here for ComFest Community Festival, which is um, a 44-year-old festival here in Columbus that is produced solely by volunteers. We work year-round, and while people think it is merely an event, what we actually do is showcase community organizations. I'm on the committee that books all sorts of educational workshops, 
and uh, we bring in speakers to talk on a variety of topics that are of current um, interest to um, everybody in the community. And, um, and we, we also provide all sorts of ways for people to volunteer beyond the festival itself. We also, everything that we make gets plowed back into the community. We give away tens of thousands of dollars each year to uh, community grants to other community organizations. And we uh, give gifts to Parks and Rec and the neighborhood and the city and so on and so forth. So um, everything that people do is done, even the artists who perform are performing as volunteers. So. Um, it's a culture of volunteerism in both of these organizations, and given that I'm an addictive volunteer, um, it's, they're, they're both really perfect for me. Thank you, Connie. Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Boggs, and I have coordinated the South Central Hilltop Block Watch for 19 years. And that's how, to, how I started out volunteering, but um, it's led into a lot of other Things. So you can see me doing, uh, I can pick up trash on the streets and in, in our alleys for six, seven hours one day. The next day I'm working on a national night out event that draws a thousand community members together to take back our streets. Other days I could be working on code enforcement issues. Other days I can be meeting with all of our city officials and um, even neighbors, trying to get neighbors involved. I, I'm on my social networking quite a bit, trying to get other people pulled in to, because it's gonna take all of us to take our community back. We live in a kind of rough area of the hilltop and uh, it's, there's some rough stuff going on. So I'm working with our police department, you know, just trying to take our neighborhood back and uh, every day it's something different, but it's worth it because there's so many wonderful people I get to meet along the way. Thank you. Hi. Sorry. Hi. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say I'm really honored to be here and thank um, Ms. Allison Pontier and Ms. Gail Gray for allowing me to be here. Um, my name is Amber Hudson. I'm the founder and director of MASH Pantry, and we are a pantry serving veterans, military families, and survivors. Um, we started, well, I started this journey almost four years ago. At first, we were just going to be a pantry serving a community in Pickway County. I didn't get much backing because I think that people saw that, you know, people start things and don't follow through. But I never give up, and <laughs> I think they see that now. Um, but I uh, was blessed with a position on a contract at the Columbus VA, and I became the social butterfly of the Columbus VA and was blessed to sit down and listen to the veterans and hear their needs and listen to their stories. And um, through that, uh, my um, 501c3 came through and uh, we ended up going a different route. And now we're you know, we opened the doors uh, May of last year, and we've been going strong. Uh, we were just, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm normally just behind the scenes. Um, <laughs> but we were just a pantry up until uh, March of this year, and we decided to go uh, start an outreach program. Now we serve different counties, we rent trucks, and we take fresh produce, we take um, non-perishable items and clothing, uh, personal hygiene items, we go to Delaware County, Pickaway County, different areas in, in Franklin County. One of the areas is uh, the Commons at Livingston, which is 100 formal, formerly homeless veterans in that community. Uh, some of the veterans could have, you know, the night before been living under a bridge. So we go in there, uh, we're very big on potlucks because we love to eat. Um, so, um, you know, we, we try to bring, you know, food brings people together. Um, you know, I've, I've just been fighting to bring this to pass. 
Um, I'm a veteran myself, so I know that it's a very proud group. They don't want to ask for help. So we don't, we don't let them ask, we just give. Thank so you. I'm just honored to be here. Thank you, Amber, that's beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful indeed. Mm -hmm. Coach David. <laughs> um, I'm Coach uh, David Jackson. I'm part of Newburgh Christian Ministries on the east side. Um, how football came about over there was just uh, a couple of us coached and the pastor seen a uh, vision that putting kids in a better environment in the little, little league football. And uh, we started off our very first practice we had, and that's about 15 years ago, about 120 kids just for football. Um, we're probably at 150 consistently, and this year we're planning to have two teams um, which will take us over about 250 young men that will be um, participating in, in football. Um, we have uh, about 85 uh, drill team. We have a varsity, a junior varsity, and uh, we call them the minis uh, because they're so small. But there's probably about 85 of those and probably about 70 cheerleaders. So we're looking at, you know, what we do is, is probably serving um, about 400 plus kids. Um, and when you're dealing with 400 plus kids, you're dealing with 800 parents <laughs> who all have a, 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 a priority and that's their child. So um, it, it's something that we have worked on to become um, effective in our community. We truly believe that um, it is a village and um, I'm a product, product of, uh, my father was very firm, um, I'm very firm, and we know that that's not effective for every child, and so each coaching staff has four to six coaches because I can't change who I am. However, that kid, we can recognize who is effective for him, and so after I um, talk to him, very firm. Mm -hmm. We have another coach that I'll walk by and say, hey, fix that. Mm -hmm. So that we, we balance and that kid will walk away from football having a positive image of me as well as his, ex his experience of football. Everyone plays um, for us. And with that being said, we still win championships where we may play a team that, you know, only their best 15 play. And so when we volunteer as coaches, we're volunteering not just to teach football, but we're also teaching how to be a young man and transform into adulthood. Um, so um, volunteering is, is, a, is a great experience. And as we go through the questions, I can give great um, experience and rewards from volunteering. Thank you. We look forward to that. Coach Jackson. Danius, please join, uh, introduce yourself. Yes, um, thank you for having me. <laughs> um, my name is Danius Williams. I am one of the co-founders of an organization called Ignite, igniteourcity.com. Um, and really, it's funny how this all happened, how it all birthed. I was uh, an executive director at a large local church that could have anywhere from eight to 10,000 people at a Christmas uh, service and um, I've always loved volunteering. Um, I actually was an intern at the City of Columbus in the Community Relations Department. I was their very first intern. <laughs> that ages me, so it's fine. Um, but I realized that um, I had a heart for compassion. I had a heart for volunteering. Um, I'm an immigrant to the U.S. and so when we first moved here to the States from Venezuela, our family had a lot of needs and there was a lot of different organizations that assisted us. If it wasn't food, it was clothing. If it wasn't clothing, it was ESL classes for myself and my parents. And so we got to see firsthand the benefits of what awesome people can do to make a difference in people's lives. Um, and so working with the city of Columbus, I really began to have a huge heart for outreach and for volunteering. And as I grew into my different roles and in this um, most recent role, I realized that a lot of people are hungry to serve and to make a difference. People want to help. Um, and at, at Ignite, we really want 
to help people help people while discovering their purpose. But I realized that even within the very own church community, although people mean really well, they want to make a difference, there's a disconnect from, if I dare say, say the suburbs versus the real heartbeat of the community, what the real dire needs are in our community. And so we are creating a platform so different organizations can have a voice. They can have um, awareness to those resources, those individuals that can really make a difference, that can really play a huge part in changing the way Columbus looks. And we believe that putting that information, that education in front of people, we could see Columbus rapidly change because the truth is there's so many people hungry to make a difference and we just want to provide those pathways in order for people to do that. Thank you, Daniels, and so much the reason why we're here. All of you, fantastic. So as you can see, we have a very diverse panel doing a lot of great work in different areas, but I think we all heard the same theme, very much like to work behind the scenes. They see a need and they have that passion. They're passionate and tenacious and they will not stop. This is not going in and out. They are there for the long haul and that's what's exciting. So let's dive a little bit deeper into our topic and, and, and let's talk about what motivates you to give and, and, and for others, for our community? And do you have to be a compassionate person to give? You know, I, I was thinking about this before I came today and, and the idea of compassion, where it comes from, whether or not um, you're born with the gene <laughs> or whether it can be taught whether or not we're, our, the awareness that we have of so much, so many people in need, um, the media is making us more sensitive or desensitizing us to it. Um, it's an interesting thing for me. I mean, it was a family value. Uh, I, I, my first time volunteering was volunteering to be the Red Cross representative for my, my elementary school when I was in the fourth grade. I was also doing things like getting my clubs to make toys for uh, kids in the hospital over the holidays. I was always kind of coming up with stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, there may be just something in a personality that drives a person to want to do it, but I do think part of what drives you is compassion. I was a, am a blessed person. That doesn't mean my life is perfect or has always been perfect or it doesn't have anything to do necessarily with how much you have, but, but my life has been blessed in so very many ways. And, and I wasn't taught just to count my blessings, but to share my blessings. That, that the idea was that you really are responsible. I think it's at the root of all of our, our value systems, spiritual or otherwise, is that we are responsible for one another that we are our brother's keeper, that, that, the wor that we get the world we deserve because you have to work for it. And I think my philosophy has always been one of be of service. Um, you know, and we can do that through our religious institutions, we can do it through political, social, et cetera, institutions, but, but you need to be of service. It might just be making sure the neighbor next door is checked on when you don't see them for several days or having resources you can share with other people when you see that they, you understand they need something. Um, but I, you know, I, I think compassion is at the very heart of it. You feel the need to give something back and, and you see need out there and you can't turn away from it. So I think compassion is a really important element of it. I think you're born with it because, I, like you said, I mean, I, when I was younger, I was always out um, shoveling snow for the old folks or mowing lawns or just go, running to the store for some of the older folks. And, you know, I just always was trying to help people at a very young age. And it just snowballs as you go through life. You just you want to do more and more. And I was in a foster home. Um, when I turned 10 and my foster mother was, she was adamant that we give back. She said, you just, you can't take through life. You have to give back. So she was always, she always had me doing the heart fund and, um, you know, I'd be the one out collecting 
for every cancer and heart fund and uh, organizing kinder key, caroling, getting, you know, having parties like, and then donating the money and, you know, out collecting food. And then um, 19 years ago, uh, we were having, I had moved to the hilltop and I saw a need in the neighborhood to bring us all together for, because everybody seemed to be like stuck to their self and afraid. And I just saw this need to bring us all together. So that's when I started the block watch. And from there, it's like snowballed. It's just like, now it's like a part of life every day is something different. And you're always trying to, like you call the older, I'm still with the older folks, which I'm getting older now. I need younger folks to, <laughs> to help me. But ev you know, I have old folks that check in every day. You know, and if they don't check in, I'm calling, why didn't you call me today or whatever. So um, out, you know, in the streets picking up the trash because I feel like if you, if you uh, live among blight, you feel not so good about where you live. So I'm out in the streets quite often, almost a couple times a week for five and six hours a day, just like in the alleys, cleaning trash and calling the refuse department. I know I've uh, started garbage, National Garbage Man Day that's uh, June 7th. Well, I didn't start it, but I brought it to Columbus or whatever. I advocated for our garbage men to get their just rewards because they're the unsung heroes. They clean our trash and take away our, our um, unwanted. So just every day is something different, but I get to meet so many different people and people like all of you in this room. I mean, I've met so many wonderful people that have blessed me and I just, uh, I can't imagine life not volunteering and being connected to everybody and just loving everybody in my neighborhood, even, even some of the bad guys. I mean, I see good in everyone and I would like to see all of us come together and uh, make a better community, especially for the kids. So, but it's just something that's inside of you and it grows, believe me, because now it's like, you know, you, you see yourself getting older and you have to finish what you started. I've been doing the, the block watch 19 years. I'm saying I'm taking back this neighbor. I say it every day. I'm taking back this neighborhood. We are going to have a better community and we don't give up. We don't give up. So, so true. So yep. True. Thank you. Somebody else? Um, you know, I honestly... From my heart, I, I look out right here, and I see the love of my life, my mom. I'm so overwhelmed with my childhood, my life. I have three amazing boys that are grown up now. And what I've put together and what I've made with my mom's help, because I've almost walked off a ledge numerous times and almost given up with Mash Pantry. Um, but I didn't because my mom and my children um, kept me going strong. Um, but um, I, I think that, you know, at, at times being a volunteer, you, you want to throw in the towel. and you feel like you're not making a difference. But it's, it's those times that when you have the love, the foundation, um, you know, one thing I wholeheartedly believe in with volunteering is it, you can't just tell a child to do volunteering. It has to be the family volunteering. Um, my volunteering started not at a young age. I mean, I had so much love in my family, but my volunteering started, um, I was a single mom for about 15 years. I mean, my children had a wonderful father, but he wasn't supporting me. I wasn't his problem. Um, I had to take care of my children, though, when they came to my house. And I walked in with my children off the street every Wednesday at a food pantry, I mean a, a soup kitchen. And I was too proud to tell them that I didn't have enough money to feed my children that day. So we walked in and we prepared the food, we served the food, and we cleaned up. I didn't tell my kids till a few years later that 
we needed to do that because I depended on those people there to feed them. And I want to be that person that those people can depend on. Um, Later years, we did a blanket drive for my children's school. And, and it, went, it wasn't as successful as I had hoped, but we tried. And, you know, you, you just have to continue on. I, I wholeheartedly believe that you, you surround yourself with people that, that have the same hope and, and believe. And you can make a difference. And, um, you know, positiv- positivity can happen. Um, you know, I'm, I fall all the time, but I get right back up. Um, and compassion is, is all around. It's, it's, it's everywhere. Um, I, I mean, living proof right there. My mother is, is a blessing every day to me. Um, you know, she, she's my role model, and I adore her. Um, you know, one day I, I walked in off the street and decided to be a, a volunteer for hospice. I did it only six months because my father passed and I couldn't go back again. I mean, I'm not, I make mistakes all the time. I'm not a hero by any means. I'm not perfect, but I try to make myself a better person every day because my children, I want to live up to be the best I can for my kids and for my mom. And for my dad, my dad's not with me anymore. But it gets me one step closer to be with him one day. And I think I'm so blessed to be among all these people that are trying to be a better person every day. And everybody out here, you know, you are trying to be a better person every day. So compassion is, is here. I mean, I can feel it in the room. Thank you. So. Truly, what wonderful testimony. So. Coach Jackson. Um, compassion is something that uh, it's funny when you talk about a football coach and compassion because we're so it's like this. But the reason I started coaching football was um, we hear about the concussions and all that 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 goes on and why you shouldn't let your son play football. Well, I go back to when I was taught. And when I was eight or nine, we were It was called the heads up drill. And we would lay on our back. And this is how everybody was taught in the 70s. You lay on your back, you get up, and they taught us to ram helmets. That's what was taught. And so it didn't hurt you at eight because you didn't have any weight for that collision. But as I grew and kept playing, um, now you're 200 pounds running into a 200 pound guy in high school and I knew that I could not change and my high school coach kept he would run me he would do this he would do that but it was ingrained in me at eight nine and ten when I wanted to hit somebody hard and that's part of football and I I call it locking in when I locked in on them I would drop my head and you were in high school twice this, this is crazy. I lost Philly. I'm laying there. Philly came back, got up, ran back in the game. Coach was like, I'm good. Now I'm laying there paralyzed. Um, and so I share that to say when I started coaching football, I just wanted to teach the kids the right way to hit, the right way to tackle, get your head to the side, and then you start to realize you're starting to build these relationships with these young men, these little boys. And now you follow them to high school, to college, and you're watching them grow and you realize, my wife's here and I told her, I'm not coaching next year. Yeah, right. (laughs) Um, Every year, you're not coaching. I'm not coaching, I'm done, I'm I'm tired, it's killing me. Uh, We got coaches meeting next week. Um, and so I got into it because I wanted to teach the kids the right way. I don't think it was compassion when I started. I thought it was just I'm going to teach them the right way and I'll get away from it at some point. And now I leave when football season gets going. I leave my house at five o'clock. 
I get home at 8.30, maybe 9. Me and my wife were supposed to go out on a little date last night. We had a football meeting at 7. I got home at 10. <laughs> and I'm talking to her, telling her, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, I know you might be mad. Uh, it's the kids, mom, it's the kids, it's the kids. And, and so we all put our heart into volunteering and coaching, and it started off teaching them one way, and the next thing you know, I'm ordering equipment, I'm over this, these three, 400 kids and making things communicate. And so we start off, I think a lot of us maybe, I'm just gonna help out a little bit. And next thing you know, you're completely over it. And now your life revolves around volunteering. And it's not, um, a, none of us do anything for a status. We don't get no award for this. All we get is a tired night, um, sleepless night, a frustrating, her birthday falls in October. I have a game every year on her birthday. <laughs> and what happens? I fuss all the way to wherever we're going. And she just listens. And so when we volunteer, it's not really just us who volunteers. It's our families. It's everybody in your, in your life um, volunteers with you, whether they're out there or not. So um, like I said, come about three or four weeks from now when we start football, she sees me on the weekends. That's about it. So our family has compassion. We have compassion. But it's all started with, I'm just going to help out just a little bit. <laughs> Love it. Thank you, Coach. Dan? Um, I feel like I started from a very young age because I was exposed to different lifestyles. I think coming from an underprivileged country, I always knew that my parents sacrificed so much to bring us here to the U.S. so that we could study, so we could go to college, so we could do something. So I think that was always a driving force for me. But as I experienced life, I realized that I wasn't just compassionate to helping the other people that I knew needed help. I became really compassionate about educating other people about the needs. And so really in all the different facets in, that I found myself in, I became really hungry to help other people see the needs that are out there. Because as I started having those conversations, you realize people are excited. They are hungry to make a difference. And so it has to take an army of us, right, to come together and to educate and to allow them to see what the needs are. Um, the truth is people are busy. Their lives are busy. They're working full time. They have kids and, and they mean well. But unfortunately, when it comes to volunteering, that's probably not the very first, second, third or fourth thing on their priority list. And that's OK, because then there's people like us that can take the time to do the homework to then share with them what they can do. Even if it's a little something, it's something. All of our little efforts combined make a huge impact. And so. I think for me, the, the compassion really comes from the community. It comes from just being around people. I thrive off of learning what other people are passionate about. And so, like somebody else was saying, it, it kind of it kind of snowballs on top of each other. And it is. It's a whole family effort. It's not just you. Um, I was working full time at this executive director role. And after leaving there, so many people asked me, like, well, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? And I'm like... I just want to serve, I guess. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't have a job. I don't make any money. My poor husband, he's so good to me. He's like, you do that, babe. You just go out there. And I'm like, thanks, boo. But, you know, like, we, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be able to do this. But this is what makes my soul happy. Like, I don't need a paycheck. I don't need a title. I don't need any of those things. If I know that I'm doing my little part to make a difference, then that's all I need. I don't know if that's called compassion or if that just comes with time, but I think that we can all come to find our own compassion if somebody's willing to take the time to lead us there. Thank you, thank you. I'm probably at an unfair advantage here because I have an opportunity to really see our panelists up close, and it's amazing how their eyes are sparkling as they're talking. You can tell the passion mm -hmm. and the compassion they all feel. And I think we all can kind of relate to having people in our lives, whether they're family, friends, others, who give us that leg up. Certainly it was in my life like that, and I'm passionate about giving back. That was one of the reasons I changed from a for-profit role to a non-profit role. And I know many in the audience have that same passion. 
But I also heard us say many of us have, uh, it was a family value. You know, our parents were a role model or we were exposed at an early age. So let's talk about the benefits of volunteerism for young folks. And I'm sure the coach will have lots of examples just because you deal with a younger population. But what are you doing? What can we be doing to exposing young kids to volunteerism, compassion, when they may not be getting those life lessons at home? Anybody? You know, I think that we, we talk a lot about this in, in Simply Living and in Comfest. How do we attract younger people to come in and do this work? Because we are getting old, <laughs> a lot of us. Um, there's a lot to be said for, for volunteerism. I mean, the studies would suggest that people who volunteer are less isolated, are happier, have better health, um, avoid depression. These are actual physical benefits of being out there and being involved and doing something. Um, moreover, as you volunteer, a lot of the skills that I've developed in my life have been learned volunteering for something. It's a way to develop more skill sets that you can, and it's also a way of sort of discovering your bliss. Um, and believe it or not, while volunteering, job opportunities find their way to you. Um, and, and so you might just find what you really want to do while volunteering, or at least develop the skills that when you want to apply for a job as a younger person uh, and, and begin a career, you actually can show something that you know how to do. Um, certainly the meeting of people and the developing of a community that you feel you have a voice and a hand in. I watch the world today be very angry, very frustrated. Um, and a, a lot of people suffer from that feeling of helplessness. What can I possibly do? Every little thing it, it makes a difference. You know, uh, Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. Um, uh, socialists say those who show up get to make the decisions. Um, you know, I mean, the fact is, is that if you're there and if you're taking part, you have more effect on the kind of community, the kind of planet, the kind of neighborhood, the street that you live on. I, you know, I'm sitting here listening to these people, all of whom I'm terribly impressed with. And I'm going, these people need to, their projects, they need to apply for ComFest grants next year. <laughs> you know, you need to sign up and get your, your group out there on our street fair, you know, so that people become aware of you. That's how we all begin to help each other. Um, you know, Simply Living uh, has what has been called Simply Living Sustainable University. It's actually a coalition of different groups around town that provide education and workshops for people. And it can be about, again, about you know, cooking or food production, or it can be about you know, working with homeless people. Uh, Comfest has done a lot of work with, with Homeless Foundation and the food banks, et cetera. So I'm really thinking that you need to give us a, a, a grant application next year. Um, but you know, we build safer neighborhoods, neighborhoods our kids can go out and play in. Uh, intentional neighborhoods is one of Simply Living's uh, uh, goals. And in fact, Clintonville Sustainable uh, Intentional Community has been quite successful. Um, providing education, giving people the opportunity to just share their talents. Maybe you have a job you go to every day, but your real love is something else altogether, and you don't have many opportunities to share that with other people. Well, organizations like ComFest and Simply Living provide you with venue and opportunity to go out there and and, and share your skills and talents with the rest of the community. So, I, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for what volunteering does for young people. It is uplifting. And, and sometimes we've talked about this at, at Comfest retreats. What do you get out of, out of doing this? We work year round, two or more meetings every single month until spring when it really amps up. And, you know, well, why do you do this? And, we really have to recognize that it makes you feel good. It makes you feel like you're 
not just sitting back going, oh my God, the world is a mess. Those people have nothing. You know, there's a tsunami. Let's have a poetry reading and raise money for the tsunami people. That's what you do. You think of whatever it is and you do what little you can and you feel better for it. And that happens at any age, but by the time, but when you're young, and, and I so agree, your family and your friends and your neighbors need to model it. That's, that's the first place. But it isn't like you can't learn to do it or if you're driven to do it and you don't have that model at home. It isn't like your law all is lost. I mean, there are, you just have to go out there and find it. And I think most people who really want to do it, do it. But how do we as organizations attract those people? That is always the issue and the problem. Um, I think there are tons of people out there who want to volunteer and they think, oh, I don't think I know what to do or that they would want me or that I have the skills. You, it's on the job training. <laughs> So, you know, find something you're interested in, see something that, you know, and Google them or call them up or send an email to somebody or ask a neighbor you know is involved in something, say, how can I help? And, you know, it, it, it really doesn't take that much to get involved, but sometimes it really takes us reaching out and grabbing them by the hand and saying, come on in here, I could really use a hand. And that is one of the things that those of us who are addictive volunteers have a problem with sometimes, is we know how to do something, we know how to get it done, and we just kind of go after it. And, and we, we need to take the time to mentor yeah. and teach. That's a really important aspect of being a volunteer long-term, is that you know how to do these things, you've got to mentor other people so that they can come into the fold and have those same satisfactions and create even more change in the community that we want. She said it all. <laughs> really. I want to add really quick, Miss Gail Gray. Um, when I was young, I had always had like a, this drive to to just make a difference. And um, Gail Gray came into Ohio State and spoke at one of my courses. And I thought, this lady, I have to know her and I have to work with her. So I emailed her. And I said, can I come be your intern? And she's like, we don't do that here. And I'm like, but you'll really like me and I'll do whatever you want. And so she ended up allowing me to come and have a meeting with her. And I remember when she met me, she's like, how old are you? Cause I look like I was 10 and she <laughs> still gave me a chance, but she exposed me to so much and those values have ran with me throughout my entire career. I've had the privilege of being in a lot of executive positions and those seeds really came into my role as a leader in those different um, areas where I really began to foster this idea that I need to always be working to replicate myself, to really work myself out of a job. And I think that goes hand in hand with these organizations, these efforts that we're making that we have to really work hard to invest in our young people so that they can also grow up to be people who want to make a difference, who believe in themselves. You know, as this young kid, I necessarily didn't believe myself. And remember my first year with her, she's like, well, you're gonna help me run the culture fest. And I said, what, uh-huh, come again? And like literally she gave me so many responsibilities and really, really trusted me, this kid, with things that I should have probably not been trusted with. But she's great and she taught me through that. She was a great mentor and I think all of us have to think, if I'm wanting to become something, who is it that's pouring into me and who am I pouring into to make sure that I'm not just walking to only find success for myself or for my organization or for my business, but who am I pouring into to bring success into their lives? I love that, nice, thank you. Lisa, I, I am, coach? my father, I was a, probably 11, and I cut grass in the neighborhood. And um, we were driving down the street, the lawnmower was in the back of the, the truck, and or, he said, there was an older lady cutting grass. He said, cut her grass. I said, well, how much should I charge her? I don't charge her nothing. Get out and cut her grass. And next week, you're going to cut it again. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm cutting it. I'm angry. Why is he making me do this? He never said why. He never said. About the third cut, um, she was so grateful. 
that I understood. You know, again, my father was cut through. Yes, this is the way it is. Don't question me. He didn't explain it. But I learned that, you know, you give to the elderly. You do this for kids. You do that. And so um, our society is a little different now. You've got to talk to kids a little better than, than the, the 70s where you, your, your parents just told you what to do and you did it. Um, now you have to talk. And so the the... the the we have to take the kids and we have to talk them into it, but we have to bring them with us, even if they don't understand it the first time, the second time, maybe the third or fourth time they get it. Um, but we have to show them and give them a direction. The reward will come when someone comes up and says, I appreciate what you do. And, and that's when it will come. But the younger kids, and I'll say we have to start as young as we can, um, just a little pat on the back will get them, but they're not going to volunteer to do it. Our society today, they're sitting in the house with air conditioning and Xbox and all the toys that they can have. Um, so we have to kind of strongly encourage them mm -hmm. to go out and volunteer to do and for new birth and what we're doing. The kids that are now in their early 20s that played for us are now coming back and coaching. We're not throwing them into the fire and say, you're gonna run this, but you're gonna work with me. And again, in that three or four years, when we take another step back, they're there ready to continue um, the vision that our pastor has for the youth. So we have to strongly encourage them without giving them options <laughs> to help. But then the reward is big because even when I do make them do something, um, I then say, hey, let's go. And I give them the reward. They don't know that's coming. But you still encourage them and appreciate for, for them so that you just plant the seed and hope it grows. And a lot of love, right? A lot of love. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Please, or Amber. Um, you want to go? Oh, okay. Um, not okay. Um, not this past Christmas, but um, the year before, we hadn't opened the pantry, but uh, we knew that we wanted to do a food drive for the veterans. Uh, we were antsy and wanted to get it going, and uh, so we joined forces with a, another organization. And we promoted a food drive at uh, Champion Middle School. And I'm sure you know Champion is not a rich school. And um, they honestly need food themselves in that area. But they did an amazing job getting cans. I mean, they collected over 1,000 cans of food. And what I did was I called Rickenbacker and I got some soldiers to come to collect the cans. And those soldiers, uh, well, we went over there and they didn't have boxes. Uh, everything was just a bunch of cans laying there. And so I had to run back to U-Haul and get some boxes. And, but when I came back, it was amazing. Um, the, the class that um, collected the most cans was sitting on the auditorium or the the cafeteria, like the stage step. And um, the soldiers were sitting, standing in front of them. There was probably about five soldiers. And it was kind of like a Q&A. The students were asking them questions. The soldiers were answering. And it was, it was just amazing. It was, uh, the soldiers were telling them, you know, stay in school. And they were asking them, you know, what's it like? What was boot camp like? And different things like that. And I was just observing. And I thought to myself, you know, it, I mean, it was not a recruiting session. It was more, they were getting to know what it was like to be in the military, what it was like every day um, just to be in the military. And these were everyday heroes to them. Well, I got the boxes, and here these soldiers were helping right along with students collecting these boxes, you know, this food. 
And I asked one of the girls, would you please go help me get the boxes? Well, as we took our walk, this little girl said, I've never met a female soldier before. I think I'm going to tell my mom I'd like to join the military. Now, this girl, maybe she didn't do that when she went home, but can you imagine? I mean, wow, what a moment that was. Now, what I did was I came up with a proposal, and I wrote it. And I submitted it, actually, to the Columbus School District for us to do food drives throughout the school district, to take veterans, to take soldiers with us, not to, not to recruit students, but to show students what volunteering is about, to do like a week's food drive, to introduce them to heroes, to let them have a one-on-one -on -one with these soldiers, to bring history back, to show respect, to, to get them involved, to bring in um, you know, families. Families could come in just to kind of, I mean, it's, it's, it's time to bring in families, to, to learn respect, to, to bring in well, you know what I mean. I'm, I'm really passionate about this. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, again, volunteering starts with the family. And I, I just, I'm, I'm just really passionate about it coming from the families. And I'm, I'm scared about what's in the future for all of us because it's a day and age. It's an entitlement age. You know, it's instant gratification. We need to, you know, get kids involved. So, I'm sorry. No, 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 wonderful. Love when you speak It's wonderful. Thank you. Lisa? I agree. Too, it starts with the family because um, when my son was younger, we homeschooled. And so we immersed ourselves in volunteerism. He grew up. That was kind of what his schooling was. It was because his writing... Well, he's a journalist now for scripts, but his writing started as um, the Block Watch newsletter. Um, he helped me start the Block Watch. He was like the youngest, um, like a teenager on the Hilltop Area Commission. I mean, he was always doing something. So that, I mean, he was always involved in everything and uh, working, you know, right along with the police officers for our block watch and every, I mean, it was all fam. And we couldn't have done it without my husband though because he works 60 hours a week so that we can give back because he thinks that what, what you give, you get back. So he's doing his part, we're all doing, we're all doing our part. And uh, we're all together though as a family. But the thing is in our neighborhood, in our hilltop neighborhood, it turns over so much you can't grab a hold of these kids to help them because they're moving because they can't afford their their rent and so on our block I mean the people are just moving there's a few of us that are stable and we try we're hanging on together we're just hanging on uh, to each other trying to make sure our, our neighborhood doesn't go down the tubes so we're just staying in contact we're trying to get rid of the dopers because right now, dope and prostitution, Sullivan Avenue, you go to Sullivan and Harris, any of you, go to Sullivan and Harris, there's 30 prostitutes walking around. Pimps, they're, I mean, it's, it's bad. It's rough. And so we, I agree, family is everything. We've stuck together, and we're a team. And my husband, even though he works 60 hours a week, he's out on the weekend. Our date is going out picking up trash. Because when, you, when you're surrounded in blight and trash, you feel like trash. You don't feel good about where you live. So we, we think that that is one thing. We can't bust the prostitutes and the dealers. We, we, can't, we can't bring you know, the, who we want into the neighborhood. We can't choose our neighbors, but we can pick up trash. And we can try to get, we try to stop and talk with the young kids along the way, trying to get them involved in different things. But it's hard because you can't, like, you can't get into somebody's family. So we're trying to figure out how now, I've, I've brought some of my neighbors, and I have a neighbor that's 63 years old that goes out six hours a day to pick up trash. Six hours every day. And when we pick up trash, I'm not talking just litter on the streets. I'm talking 
uh, bags of uh, human waste because there's people that that are uh, don't have plumbing in their house. So you're p picking it up out of the alleys. You're picking up needles. You're picking up hooker bags. You're you're picking up all kinds of used condoms. All all different things. I mean, it's 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 a lot. And but we're trying to we're trying to bring more people into it. And that's why I call my I call everybody on my list every. All the time I'm calling or they're calling me and I'm trying to get people involved. And that 311 number is amazing. 614-645-3111. They will, they will help you find what's wrong, going on in your neighborhood. You, I mean, if you have, like, blighted homes, I'm always on the phone to 311. I mean, just trying to get the, the homes cleaned up. Uh, working with our uh, code enforcement officers because we've got to get our we've got to get our neighborhoods cleaned up. Well, this is a great segue, and thank you for that resource. Yeah. And I think the city's doing a lot, but we all need to be doing more. And I know you're doing great work in the hilltop, uh, in the hill, yeah, hilltop. Mm -hmm. um, how critical is volunteerism to our community, to our city, to keep a vibrant community for people wanting to live here and thrive here and raise a family? Just a few thoughts on that before. In a few minutes, we will be opening it up to questions to you, Val, but let's talk about that. The impact on our community, on our city. I think it's huge. Um, you know, there are a lot of challenges that face our streets, and that's everywhere. Um, I did a gala about two years ago in Mirfield, um, right before the Memorial Tournament. Um, I don't know how much you all know about human trafficking, but the Mirfield Memorial Tournament has one of the largest rates of human trafficking because people don't realize that that happens right in the neighborhoods that you don't expect it to happen. Um, and I think that comes along with a lot of the different challenges our community faces is that um, it's a really vicious cycle, you know, the drug epidemic in Columbus, how that plays into a part into the family situations that are crumbling these families are hurting um, and there's so many different organizations that are out there that can assist but the the truth of the matter is we need more resources we need more awareness we need more compassionate people who are willing to step into situations that are ugly that aren't very um, safe because you know these prostitutes they need help they need help getting clean they need help seeing that they're worth more they need help seeing that there's assistance there for them um, I think that as a whole our community as a whole if volunteerism went away I I would hate to see what would happen because the truth of the matter is if we don't continue to combat that it's just going to spread more and more and and the truth is it's going into the into the young people the ages between 11 to 13 to 14 is when a lot of these traffickers, a lot of these men are targeting these young girls who are vulnerable, very susceptible to manipulation, to feeling like this is their hope for love. And it's not where you think it is. It's in the suburbs. It's everywhere. Um, people have this stigma that, oh, it's on the hilltop or it's the Linden community. I mean, there's so many um, dangers out there for our all of our young people that we really have to do our due diligence to get into our communities, see what's happening and really make a difference, make a, make a valid effort to, to change that. Um, you know, the hilltop with the casino, for example, has been exposed to a lot more crime and um, a lot of people are hurting and hurting people hurt people, right? Um, and, and a lot of it comes down to the expectations that these people are held to. Um, they don't know any better. You know, there's a lot of mental health that I think goes undiagnosed, that goes untreated. And so people tend to go to drugs or other habits that are unhealthy for them. So there's so many different ways that we as a community can come together to make our community as a whole better. So true, and you know, yeah. I'm glad you brought up the human trafficking. A few years ago, we did at Comfest a, um, a seminar on human trafficking, and we will again this year with the Ethiopian group that works with um, human trafficking here in Columbus, and it truly is under our noses. And you're right, it's in good communities. So are drug houses, people living in beautiful communities. Maybe they have a condo or a house they rent, and um, it, it happens in Worthington, Dublin, you name it, Hilliard, it's happening. The fact is, is that we, without volunteers stepping up, the city and the government isn't going to do 
I'm not going to say anything because they're going to do something. But they're, they're, they don't have the resources. We are their resources. That's the point is we are I mean, government of, by, for the people. We are the government. If we do not get involved and we do not point things out and hold them accountable, if we do not pass frankly, the monies that need to be passed in many situations to address these things, and, and, and in my opinion, stop with this, we need to be a tax-free society. The strongest countries in the world that have the fewest of these problems have the highest taxes. If we do not get over the idea that corporations are going to desert us if we make them pay their fair share, I think we're in a lot of trouble. The government does not operate on air and gas fumes. It's got to have us working for it, and it's got to have money resources so that it can fix things. I think we are luckier than many towns in Ohio. I'm pretty well acquainted with Cincinnati, Toledo, Cleveland, and I can tell you that we have fared much better. We've had some better leadership, in my opinion. We have a, a, a lot of people involved, a lot of good organizations working out of central Ohio to address these issues, and it's never enough. It's never enough. But if people like you do not bring the hilltop to the government's attention and just be demanding, be that, that squeaky wheel. If you do not go out there and address that situation with our veterans, which is possibly one of the most criminal things that has ever happened, is to bring our veterans home from what they do and then leave them out on the streets, have them lose their homes while they're uh, deployed overseas. These things are unacceptable ways for a society. That, that's not compassionate. That is not compassionate. Yes, we all need to be responsible for ourselves, but there are those among us who need help. And if we do not get involved, if we do not give the government our help and, and the resources to do the job, it won't get done. And we will end up with blighted communities that are, are too far gone to be brought back. And that exists in cities all over this country. Places that are just so far gone, I don't know if they'll ever come back. They certainly won't come back as they once were. And I'm not a person who wants to go back to the good old days because the good old days were filled with um, a lot of sexism and racism and classism and things that just weren't okay with me. I don't think those were just such wonderful days. But we have now, volunteerism broadens your horizons. That's one of the great things it does. It broadens your worldview and it puts you into contact with many different kinds of people in different neighborhoods. That's really good because that helps make you more compassionate. If you're given to compassion at all, that's going to help get you over the hurdles to help people in need. Education is a huge, huge part of this. That's why I go back to the two organizations that I'm talking about today. Not only do we give monies away and, and help people directly, but we also supply educational opportunities for people to begin to help themselves and help their communities. We help you develop the skills to go back and do the things that these people up here are doing in their neighborhoods. And, and, and that's, that's the best that I think we can do in large organizations like this right now, because I think the more people know, the more people will respond. That's, that's my hope. I have to believe that, ever the idealist. But it really takes all of us, it right? Does. It takes the village. Exactly. Anybody else to that question? I just think, I think it makes you feel better. Volunteering makes you feel better. And I would like everybody to feel better. So, and that, so why don't we all, or you all, share some opportunities for volunteerism that might, you know, if somebody's sitting in the audience and saying, okay, this sounds great, I, I want to give back. What is there to do? How can I get connected? And then uh, we'll answer some questions of the audience. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right, who wants to go first? I'll go ahead and start us off since I'm don't have a specific organization, but I really would encourage you if you're, if you've never volunteered and you're interested in just even discovering what are you passionate about, Ignite will really walk you through that process and help you get connected to organizations that are doing good. We really do our due diligence to learn what these organizations are doing and making sure that your time, your resources, and your energy are being allocated appropriately. So you're really making a difference. So IgniteOurCity.com, um, 
I love the organizations that are represented here today. Um, we have a lot of other organizations that we um, partner with. Um, we have two conferences a year as well. We think it's really important that the truth of the matter is there's a lot of people that haven't volunteered before. And so what we do is provide an, an environment where you can come, be inspired. We have speakers and music and stuff. And then we literally will kind of spotlight a service project during that conference. Our last one in May uh, spotlighted uh, human trafficking. And we have one in November that will be uh, spotlighting the drug epidemic in Columbus. And then what we do is we bring alongside us all the different organizations that are playing a major role in our city against that. So we had about 15 organizations at our last um, event. And then we just we allowed people to get connected with those but truly you know whatever it is whatever your niche is or if you don't know yet what your niche is like everybody said once you get started it's addicting like helping people is the most thrilling thing because no money can really replicate the feeling that comes from knowing that you've made even a little bit of a difference in someone's life so true. So true. I just think um, it, with all the, the youth sports, um, there's something that everyone can do. And just find something somewhere with someone, some organization dealing with our youth because, um, again, I, I used that, you know, I grew up with a strict dad, but I had um, friends that who were strict too, but just said it a little differently. and. And so as I coach, we have different people. So your person, I, I, I have five coaches that I coach with. Three are the quietest guys ever. I'm the loudest guy, the rowdiest guy, the one that's going to flip out at the kids and uh, come home like, I tell my wife, I say, you won't believe what I said today. <laughs> you said that? What did they do? They just looked at me like I was crazy and I just walked away. And I, but the other coaches are nice guys. They're soft-spoken guys. So you find people and you need people that offset your personality. My father was loud and rowdy. I'm loud and rowdy. And so you find people that offset your personality for the benefit of the kids. And so whatever it is, the youth needs so many um, people to invest in their lives that um, I use football, but it could be basketball, it could be soccer, it could be whatever it is, and they say, well, I, I don't know anything about that, but can I cook hot dogs for them? At, you know, can I do this? And they'll never forget. Um, I'm gonna share that in a football game, um, we were losing. I hate losing. <laughs> I hate it. And um, the cheerleaders are cheering. We have no timeouts. And I turn to the cheerleaders, and I said, hey, shut up. Of course, the little girls look at me. The parents look at me. At this point, I'm kind of numb to it because I just want to win the football game. And so I direct them. And so the game's over. We lost. And um, the parents steam coming off their head. And one of my coaches say, you got to deal with them. And I say, yeah. And so I go over there, and they're giving it to me like they should. And I said, just give me a minute. Let me go over to the girls and apologize. And the girls were, I'll say 11. And um, I fell on my knees and said, I'm so sorry. Never, ever, ever allow any man to talk to you like that. And so what I'm going to do for you is next week at our home game, you can buy whatever you want from the concession stand. Mm -hmm. Monday at practice, I'm bringing pizza because I should never talk to you that way. No one should. But the only way I'm going to do that if you forgive me. And so you have 10, 11 year old girls. We forgive you, Coach Dave. And they hug me and we fall to the ground. Mm -hmm. And so from that point on, I buy donuts before the game. And I give them the donuts and say, listen, if I lose my mind, this is my apology to you. And out of that group of kids, one of those little girls, 16, said, I need a godfather. And I'm her godfather. So they need um, as many men, women to invest because we as parents don't know anything. 
so we can tell them. And my nephew was a, was a kid who he's doing this, and my my brother in law knew over knew what he was telling him was right. He didn't listen. So one day I'm telling him the same thing. He did exactly what I asked him to do, which was what his dad was telling him to do, because dads don't know anything, moms don't know anything, but Uncle Dave, he's the greatest. <laughs> and so it takes so many people to invest in these kids' lives because our parents don't know anything. You remember when you was a child, what um, your parents were, you don't know, please stop talking to me, but an uncle or aunt or someone else could say, so the kids need so many um, people to invest in their lives. Thank you, Coach. I'm sorry for talking so much. No, this is great. It's a good lesson. Um, as for volunteering with MASH, uh, honestly, we're, st we're in our grassroots, so we need volunteers for everything, for um, manning the pantry, for outreach, um, for uh, finding sponsors, this is something that is, uh, I have no idea how to do, and uh, we have no sponsors. We don't know how to promote donations. Um, we're trying to keep this outreach program going and uh, to venture out to different counties and stuff and such. So, uh, you know, we're, we're finding ourselves, uh, you know, we have to rent trucks and, and stuff. So to maintain our outreach program, you know, we need to, we need assistance. Um, I'm, I'm wearing so many hats and uh, learning as I go and we're always up for suggestions. So, you know, if you find anyone who's interested in anything, um, please just have them call us and we'll definitely put them to work. And uh, we love anyone who loves to cook or bake I'm telling you, we love to eat. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you so much for everything today. Thank you, Amber. Well, we're, uh, our, we're really grassroots. We, pa we pass the kitty around in our neighborhood. Uh, like we did a flower project uh, a couple, about a month ago, and uh, we Neighbors got together and bought flower pots for, we bought 67 flower pots and the dirt, and we um, had Lowe's, we, we, we go begging, we beg a lot. So we had Lowe's donate about five, five or six hundred dollars worth of flowers. But for two blocks, my neighbor and I, that we kind of coordinated the project, uh, this really wasn't a block watch, this was just neighbors, you know. We wanted to have a unification project where Everybody has this urn on their front porch, and a, a lot of folks are really into gardening now. This after this this month, watching these urns with the um, uh, flowers just cascading over the edge. You go down our two blocks, 67 homes. You see a flower pot, and it's a it, it's on their porch or in their yard or somewhere. But you go down Ogden Avenue or South Warren Avenue, and you see these flower pots, and it's kind of like a unification that we're together, we're trying to take our neighborhood back, and it's gotten a lot of people out mowing their lawns who weren't mowing their lawns before. Everybody's kind of really into this little flower pot project. But our national night out event is with no money. We don't, we're not a nonprofit. We have no money. It's the Columbus Zoo bringing their animals. It's COSI on wheels bringing their, 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 um, experiments in, there's uh, Target grilling food, there's uh, Hollywood Casino donated um, gift cards for the big drawing because a lot of people don't have, um, they use the food pantry so when they win a gift card, we feed the people too, we love to eat. I mean, it's so they're winning these gift cards, Target donates gift cards. I mean, we're at the end of the event, we're having this big drawing and these folks are very thrilled to win a gift card where they can go choose their own food. Not, it's not just what the food pantry hands to them. They, they get their own food. So, I mean, we have the SWAT truck come in. We have all of these. It's a great event to bring the neighborhood together with law enforcement. You see all of our brass, the police, you know, of the police department there having fun with the neighbors. It's really a nice event. And uh, anyone that wants to be involved with our event is welcome. It's the uh, first 
August or first uh, Tuesday of August at six o'clock p.m. And it's uh, we close the street down, move all the cars off. I've already gotten my signatures to for the permit to close the street down. Um, we move all of the cars off, and everybody brings their whatever they're going to do for the night out, and it's a giving event. There's no no money exchange. Leave your wallets at home because this is we give. Everybody's giving. This is not to take. So this this is kind of how we do everything. We do cleanups. I end up getting Donatos to donate ten pizzas for so we can have pizza after the we eat all the time. <laughs> so when you come to any event, but we're always doing events and uh, just to bring the neighborhood together. And I would suggest if you don't really want to get involved with an organization that you just kind of do something in your own neighborhood to bring your community together because everybody's closed up in their homes now and we need to get out and come together and because your community or your house is more than your the actual structure and your four walls that your house is your community too it's part of part of uh, your home so your community is your home and I think people need to come together more instead of just be, being worried about themselves or their families. True. They need to be worried about their community. Thank you, Lisa. Connie, any final? Yeah, yeah so true. Well, um, I, I will try not to go in too long here so you have some time for questions. Um, I want to say, first of all, that ComFest is in two weeks. <laughs> and there are so many things from working on the stages to helping with cleanup recycling to I'm, um, you know, helping pass out programs. There are just million first aid is always looking for people. So there are tons of opportunities. There are also going to be a lot of workshops and a lot of community organizations that you can get acquainted with and learn more about and perhaps find that you want to get involved with those groups as well. So it's, it's a terrific opportunity if you go to comfest.com. I'm always waxing political because part of my volunteerism is doing things like going door to door, knocking on the doors, and, uh, and getting people out to vote. We'll be having a voter registration training class so that you can go away and, and make sure all of your neighbors and family and friends are registered to vote in this very important upcoming election. Um, and that'll be happening on Sunday. We'll have a little workshop for that. Um, if you've moved or something, you can also register at ComFest and get your stuff in order. Also, Simply Living will be there, and simplyliving.org, go there. Um, I hope you've picked up some of the literature back here for both organizations. It'll lead you to us. Um, they will be there, and they're going to be having a meetup on Sunday afternoon, I think it is. And there will be about eight organizations, Support Our Local Economy, uh, Interfaith uh, Power and Energy, um, uh, Sierra Club. Uh, there will be just a whole lot of organizations that will be at that meetup, and it's an opportunity to, to meet and talk to and learn about a number of our partner organizations or member organizations with Simply Living and, and get a better feel for what we actually do. So I encourage you to come to ComFest, go to the workshops, go online and, and, um, and, and find out more about both the organizations and, and give us a bit of your time and if not yours, pass it along to other people that surely you know other people who are looking for opportunities to volunteer as well. And thank you, I, I'm delighted to be here. I was kind of a fill-in at the last minute, but I can't say how happy I was. I was excited about this topic, thank so. You, thank you, all of you. Amber? I'm, I'm sorry. I just wanted to mention something. Um, starting this month, we're going to uh, have a pantry also at Rickenbacker for the military <coughs> families. So we'll be maintaining it every month. Well, you've heard a lot. There's so much room for help. One of the biggest, best lessons I ever heard was allow others to help you. Mm -hmm. And so I think you have made a fantastic case. You're very passionate about the importance of volunteerism and how it's very rewarding, it's fulfilling, and it makes a difference in the lives of others, and that's exciting. Any questions in the remaining minutes that we have? Any questions or comments? Go ahead, sir. Thank you. My name is Lothar Schlichting. I'm German. I'm here since two years now, three, three years now. And uh, 
Thank you very much for your effort. I go along there, with the family starts everything, and the family is also the school of love. And I think all of you then, once we as a child have our childhood behind us, then we come to you, and you are then taking over the, the parents. That's a, the that's a thing that you, continuation in, in our life. So I'm retired now. <laughs> I miss my family here. So my question now is to you, how, how can I come to you and participate? I would like to bring someone along, some younger, the old guy and the young guy together would come to you. Would you have some little practicum, perhaps one or two days or something like that, that you get an idea what it is about? And sometimes, sometimes you get inspired and sometimes you're thinking, oh, that's not for me. Perhaps this group or that group might be more my alley, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's a question to you. How, could you. how would you offer a job in that way, a job? <laughs> Volunteer job. Volunteer job. job. Thank you very much. To Columbus. Thank you. Uh, and I'll know everybody is, who is interested in receiving their information, uh, just let Gail know and to give her your contact information, and we'll make sure you get everybody's contact information. But Lisa, I believe you were going to say something. Well, you can contact me through the South Central Hilltop Block Watch on Facebook. We have a Facebook page. But I, and if anybody ever wants to go out and you just want to do something where you can see where you make a difference, Take, I've got buckets and grabbers and gloves. We can go clean trash for a couple hours at your convenience. I'll, I'm happy. I take, I've taken politicians out. I've taken people, everybody out in the neighborhood for a couple hours of trash picking. And you find out what's going on in the neighborhood. And you clean at the same time. So it's a really good thing to do. So anytime anybody wants to help me, I'll, I'll go out. So contact me. Excellent. Thank you. So Compost has... Uh, two meetings every month at least, and they are open to the public. And so when you go on our website, they're all listed there at comfest.org or, or .com, and you can see what our, our uh, dates are, and then you're very welcome to come and learn more about us and meet people and talk about committee work, etc. cetera. Uh, Simply Living has regular what they call meetups, social meetups. And so again, if you go online and go to their website, you will find a listing, uh, and they're, they're uh, back there. I think we've got some of the um, newsletters, and they list them as well. These meetups, you can come, you meet other people, find out what's going on, and where there are places you might want to plug into. Perfect. And we'll remember the resource table. And one final remark from Java or question. Uh, hi, I'm Java Kittrick, and I'm uh, very happy to be here. Uh, I think that, that what Java, our, to the mic? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, you another post <laughs> I would take it out, but I don't want to mess it up. So I think that what our wonderful panelists have really taught us today is that in the beginning, that maybe we're teaching the wrong values in school uh, from very, very young ages, because we're not teaching them kindness or compassion. We're teaching them core curriculum or you know, how to play with blocks or how not to bite somebody. But I think that all the lessons that uh, these wonderful people have talked about families, I mean, there's so many generations that um, are more into entitlement than into service, or that they get entitlement and they're not asked to do service in return. And I, there's too many young people that um, have given up on fighting extinction. And I think once you kind of uh, fall into that realm of sadness and don't think um, that there is a future, or what could I sell on eBay this week to live next week, that we're really losing a lot of young people and a lot of energy because they don't have a vision of themselves for the future. And we're talking about trafficking and drugs and you know all these huge, huge plagues that um, are are toppling American little cities and you know even our big cities, as they kind of pointed out. So um, I just really wanted to thank um, all these people here, you know, for sharing their experiences so forthright and honestly. And this is not, you know, it's not about. Um, 
underserved or underprivileged, you know, people. It's not really about, um, oh, it's, it's about all young people. I think we really have to dedicate ourselves to going into the schools or the playgrounds or the neighborhoods and getting children to understand that to live on this planet as a human, that we are all connected and that uh, kindness and compassion is the only way we're going to survive to the next century. So true. Thank you. Thank you, Java. So appreciate your words and certainly what you do throughout our community on a regular basis. Um, and you're right, the future, the young ones are our future. So I thank you all again you. so much for being here. I told you it was a Stella panel. I thank all of you for being here, for caring, and for all the compassion you show on a daily basis. And I do hope that you will join us for our next Lunch and Learn uh, on July the 8th, when we look at compassion and the role it plays in immigrants and refugees in our community. Thank you again for being here today.